what we do here is go back, 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 back. Hi, and welcome to Mr. Toyama's AP World History, Chapter 2, Early Societies in Southwest Asia and the Indo-European Migrations. First up, uh, like last time, to be able to successfully follow along with each lecture video, flip lecture, students will read the chapter two times, once before and again after the lecture. Information in AP World History is complex and multiple readings will allow for the information to become more comprehensible. Cornell notes will be required for each lecture. Their notes are due on the date assigned in class. The end of each lecture, make sure you prepare the other work for the classes assigned at the end of the video. And questions or concerns should be emailed if urgent or written on your Cornell notes for discussion the next day in class. So here we go. Chapter 2. Early Societies in Southwest Asia and the Indo-European Migrations. The land is called Mesopotamia, Meso between Potamia, rivers, and lies in the Tigris-Euphrates valleys in what is now known as modern-day Iraq. The mix of desert and river environment led to one of the first uses of irrigation. Irrigation led to increased food supplies, which led to increased population, which in turn led to a need for large numbers of people to be organized using what we now call government. The surplus fluid allowed governments to support building projects and more irrigation, which further increased the food supply. This is a pattern that was repeated in the other river valley civilizations. These developments led to the rise of some of the first city-states, an urban center controlling the surrounding land. From Mesopotamia come, came other innovations. Mesopotamian society was the first to introduce the use of bronze, a mix of copper and tin, and then iron. The wheel and increased ship technology for both trade and warfare also developed. Mesopotamian society included kings and nobles to administer the laws, priests to deal with increasing complex religions, peasants and laborers to do all the work, and a system of slavery. Hammurabi's code shows examples of how different social classes and genders were treated by the law. The introduction of the written word, in the form of cuneiform, revolutionized society. It led to a literature, mathematics, record-keeping of all kinds, as well as education in order to teach these new disciplines. This chapter ends with a discussion of the Jews, Phoenicians, and Indo-European migrations. The introduction of monotheism, mono, one, theos, god, began with Judaism. The rise of these pastoral nomads to the builders of Jerusalem and their culture is too detailed to delve into here, but its impact has had a profound influence on the two major monotheistic religions that followed it, Christianity and Islam. Elsewhere, during this time period, the great seaborne trading peoples, the Phoenicians, rose to power and introduced the first alphabet. Also during this era, the Indo-European migrations began. These horse-riding pastoral people spread from their homeland north of the Black Sea to Western Europe. Scandinavia, India, and Western China. Most notable among these peoples were the Hittites, who brought advanced technology for both wheels and chariots and iron metallurgy to Anatolia, modern-day Turkey, and Mesopotamia. A pattern repeated many times in world history is the rise, the peaking, and the collapse of empires. This pattern is seen within the empires of Sargon, Hammurabi, and the Assyrians, as well as others. The reasons may vary slightly, but the pattern is always there and continues into the 21st century. Alrighty, so first up, we're going to talk about uh, civilization. How would you define civilization? Many people have tried to talk about uh, civilized versus uncivilized. We're going to try and stay away from that through our course because that implies a lot about a culture as being better or worse than another. Whereas civilization, we're going to define that in our terms as an urban uh, system. So there are cities or city-states or large um, gathering places of people that have homes and a larger infrastructure of uh, larger government around that. They have a political and a military system. So like I said before, government, which orders the people and kind of collects taxes and gets things uh, surrounded with the proper bureaucracies, one of my favorite B words in all of world history, to help get the people organized and they usually specialize uh, certain jobs for people so that they know that if you have to, for example, pay your taxes, you go to the tax collector. If you have to talk to somebody who's in charge of buying land, maybe you have to go to the land person, whatever that job may be called at the time. They also had a military system, so you, if you have a large city and you have lots of money, you need to be able to protect that. So you need to have a military system of guys with swords or guys with like axes or whatever to protect your stuff. There's also in civilization social stratification. So social stratification means that 
there is a hierarchy of people. There are many different types of social stratification within um, any given society, but the one we really usually focus on is, for example, the slaves at the very bottom. They're the ones that are people that are owned by others. They're forced to do labor uh, without their consent because they're basically animals or own, property of the people uh, that own them. And then above them usually is the peasants or the working poor. Those are people who aren't very rich. They usually are living from one meal to the next, and they work very hard, very menial jobs, terrible jobs, oftentimes uh, to make a living for themselves. Then above them is usually uh, what we would call the uh, wealthy or the merchant class in a lot of societies. These are people who are like traders, people with a, a high amount of money or are able to find success in business, and they're able to... Uh, gain a lot of uh, power through that money or at least a lot of influence and then above them is usually nobility or the priest class usually kind of on the same tier the priests are the lifeline or the communications to the god or the gods of a society so what you need to have is a an honoring system that helps the priests to talk on your behalf to get the gods on your side and also you need the nobles because the nobles are just better than everybody else and they're in charge of ruling. Their decisions help the society function. The, you can think of this as like, for example, a king or a pharaoh from Egypt or an emperor from any of the empires we're going to study. Those are the hierarchies uh, that we're going to kind of talk about as we go along. They also have economic specialization. People are not all doing jobs by themselves. They have an interconnected network of jobs. So, for example, like I talked about before, a tax collector, that person's job was not to farm as well. His job was mostly just to uh, do his job, which was collect taxes. Same thing with a priest. The priest's job was not farming and sewing and knitting and all this other stuff. His main job was to pray on behalf of uh, the people to the gods that the gods may uh, find favor with the people. And the economic specialization is just people finding trades or crafts or jobs that they are good at and they stick to it. And many of you want to have an economic specialization. You want to become a lawyer or a doctor or a teacher or whatever it may be. You're not obviously going to be a farmer and a, and a lawyer and a doctor and all those things in one because that would be too um, strenuous on your time and it wouldn't make the society function as well. And by having this economic specialization, you're going to get people who are able to become very good at their job and are very efficient at their job, allowing for others to take their place because there's enough people in our community to take care of all the parts of what is needed to make the community or society function. So we need farmers, but we also need lawyers, and we need doctors, but we also need plumbers, people who fix the toilets, love fixing toilets. Uh, you need a religion in a civilization. Uh, religion can be as simple as the spirits, for example, in the case of the Native American population of the Americas, or it could be as complex as a hierarchy of gods as we're going to study a little later uh, in some of the societies that uh, arise in the early BCE times that we're studying. You also need communications. You need some way to communicate uh, ideas across vast distances and even across time. The Babylonians are going to become some of the first people to actually use written uh, alphabet to actually communicate ideas across late great distances and also time so once someone dies if their words were written down you can go back and see what they thought what they said and you can kind of infer or maybe even explicitly understand what they were thinking at the time but you do need to have some form of uh, language even before the written uh, alphabet that you might have and uh, we talked about this in the last lecture where people were going from grunts to maybe like uh, clicking sounds or uh, guttural sounds that come from the throat and even uh, moving on to now full words, maybe not words that we would understand, but obviously a form of language that people could communicate with one another in. And finally, there also needs to be some sort of higher culture. There needs to be arts. There needs to be a, uh, an aesthetic uh, beauty uh, objective that the people are looking at. So maybe they need to, uh, for example, the color blue. They, they start using special flowers that create a special dye that allows them to make uh, paint, the, a basic rudimentary form of paint, and then they can use it to paint their walls. And that is um, aesthetically pleasing, or it's, it's, it shows a higher level of culture than just uh, banging rocks together as we studied in the first chapter. And in addition to that, you have the arts, like the classical arts, like the fine arts, um, paintings, ceramics, um, you have plays, you maybe have even have poems and different forms of uh, things that we would call objectively or aesthetically pleasing. 
First up, we have uh, Mesopotamia, which is also known as Between the Rivers. Uh, the two rivers we're specifically highlighting are the Tigris and the Euphrates River. Well, this would be in what was now or what is now known as modern day Iraq. Uh, this is the cultural continuum of the Fertile Crescent. So in Iraq, uh, you would think would be a very large desert, and, and most of the Middle East has large patches of desert, but under this banner of the Fertile Crescent, you actually have uh, these two rivers that uh, flood uh, very predictably every year, and through that you can actually channel off and siphon some of the, uh, the water and the, the resources that come from a river and you're able to feed your people. If you have a very large desert, but you have water, you can eventually turn that uh, large desert uh, into farmland. And during this time, the Sumerians are the dominant people of this area. Here's a map of Mesopotamia. It's that larger green area, but we're really gonna focus here in on this red area that just uh, kind of dropped. There's the Euphrates, uh, Euphrates and the Tigris rivers. Uh, you can see Babylon, and you can see the uh, area of Sumer and Ur and Uruk and Assyria. So those are all places that we're going to be kind of looking at right now during this lecture. Now there's this wealth that comes from rivers. What happens uh, very often in rivers in this area is that it has this nutrient-rich silt. Uh, back before people were wandering around, there was uh, a lot of change to our earth. There was flooding. There was an ice age. There was a lot of um, like area of the world that was covered underwater that maybe w or that isn't uh, covered underwater today. Well, through this process, silt deposits built up along the banks of the river and even farther out from the river. And this nutrient rich, rich silt uh, is defined as a uh, fine sand or clay or other material carried by running water and deposit as a sediment, especially in a channel or harbor. And the nice thing about this is, uh, for people who are looking to farm, if you have this good silt, it holds a lot of nutrients for your plants to grow. It holds a lot of um, water in the silt itself, so it's easily irrigated. And oftentimes it's easily dug out because it's a softer uh, kind of material than like clay or rock. And uh, it's easier to farm in those areas. The key comes from irrigation. Now, irrigation is the cutting away from a river of channels that deliver water to fields, for example. Uh, the necessity of coordinated efforts. You need to coordinate people. If we were to build an irrigation system from, for example, your house through your hose on the outside of your house, we would need to find a way to do it efficiently, right? If I just took a knife and started stabbing into the side of your hose and draining water out of the side, you're not gonna get water at the very end. So you have to find a way to find a, a very good balance of getting this water to be kind of siphoned off to the right uh, farms, but also at the same time to continue down the river. Uh, the water needs to continue down farther so that it can feed other farms and it can be efficiently managed so that people can have lots of food so that many people can survive and not die of hunger. Uh, this promoted the development of local governments. If you are going to need coordinated efforts, you're going to need somebody who's in charge. And that person who's going to be in charge is going to have to say, no, you can't dig another channel. Or no, you can't dig another uh, section to kind of siphon off some water from this river. We need to have a very uh, specialized way of doing things. We need to make sure that everyone's happy and it's all fair. And so you need to have a local government that kind of oversees this whole process. And this eventually leads to city-states. They're called city-states because we understand what a city is today. It's a large uh, group of people that are self-organized and in many ways uh, appoint a very small scale government to oversee them. Like if you think about uh, where we go to school, which is Cerritos, you can see that uh, we have like a mayor and his job is to oversee the people of Cerritos and the laws of Cerritos, but then we also have above them the state of California. Now um, with city-states, they were actually more independent. The city was a state unto itself. And when I use the word state, I'm not talking about the United States, I'm using it as a state or a country, but we wouldn't call it a country as well. Uh, they were self-organized, they were um, independent from other large, uh, maybe empires or groups of people, and they kind of ran themselves. Uh, Sumer begins a small sale, scale irrigation around 6000 BCE. So this uh, little area of Sumer is doing this small-scale irrigation. They have coordinated efforts, they have a local government, and they're starting to become a city-state. By 5000 BCE, 
complex irrigation networks, the population reaches 100,000 by 3,000 BCE. Through this process, it attracts uh, Semitic migrants and it influences the culture. So these Semitic migrants move in because obviously there's a surplus of food. Everybody's always looking for food. We talked about this before. People don't want to die. Some of the necessities of life are just water and food and shelter. And so the Semitic migrants move in and their culture uh, from the Semitic Semites uh, will actually influence the culture of the area of Sumer. And so now we have the Sumerian city-states. Cities appear around 4000 BCE. They dominate the region from 3200 to 2350 BCE. Uh, Ziggurat was the home of the god in the city of Uruk. Uh, you can see a picture, like an artist rendering on the right-hand side. You can see that there's lots of green fields in the background. There were high walls in the center. There were these ziggurats or these multi-layered, almost uh, pyramid-like structures that were more square than pointy as compared to the Egyptian uh, versions of a pyramid. And uh, this was the central uh, part of the government. The, the people of uh, Uruk actually would live around the city and the government itself, and from out there, uh, radiating out from there, would be the uh, people who would farm, the people who would take care of other things. And when you think about it, in a society, you can't just have farmers. You need to have other people who do other things. You need people who make clothes, you need people who collect water, you need people who build buildings, you need all different kinds of jobs. And so uh, this is done by organizing and having, especially in this example of Uruk, a coordinated effort by the local city-state government. Uh, they build irrigation systems like we talked about before. And what's really nice about this is it has defense from nomadic marauders. If you were, for example, a kind of smart group, and you kind of banded together maybe 100, 200 people, and you all had swords or some kind of stick or rock kind of combination, you could just go around, and if you were very evil, you could attack people, take their things, kill them, and maybe even um, take all their stuff. Well, what's nice about that is you don't have to work hard, you only have to work in small bursts, and 100% of your labor is gained basically on the backs of other people. If a man is farming out in the middle of nowhere and you kill him and take his farm, well, now you have all that food. You might not have any food for next time because the farmer's now dead and you don't know how to grow anything, but at least you got the food for right now. Well, what's nice about the Sumerian city-states like Uruk is there is um, these high buildings and high walls and also a military presence. If ever there were nomadic raider, marauders, they could come in to the high walls, shut down the gates, and basically wait out the people on the outside, or maybe even fight them off. So a lot of the city's wealth, a lot of the city's resources were stored within the center of the city, protected by uh, a large military. And many times, if, for example, you lived in Uruk, you could go and join the military, and you'd be protecting your stuff. Many people today join our U.S. military, and they believe that by fighting in wars or serving their country through the military, they are protecting their homes. And that's basically what the people thought even back in the Sumerian city-states. Uh, the one thing that I want to point out is they had uh, absolute monarchies. Now, a monarch is a type of king. It's a, uh, and the absolute part means he is unquestioned in authority. In many cases, uh, many societies believe that absolute monarchs were either a god themselves or were appointed by the god or gods of the society to be in charge. Uh, for many uh, European kind of uh, peoples, they had kings that were absolute monarchs, and many people couldn't tell you why they still had that noble line. Maybe their great-grandfathers did something very noble. Maybe their great-great-great-great-great-great somebody way back when in mythology slayed a dragon, and so that's why they get to be in charge. But many uh, people just accepted that the person in charge or the monarch or the king or whatever he, may, he or she may be called, that they are in charge because that's just the way it has to be, because we need someone who's in charge, and that's good. Here is uh, the remains of the ziggurat of Ur. This is a uh, later picture. It's kind of old uh, from the 19, I want to say, 30s, 1920s, somewhere in there. Uh, in the background, you can see the, the almost the shape of the squares that were the ziggurat in the center of the city. Uh, it's basically been worn down by time, by uh, people, and over the years, it's it's very little left, which is kind of sad. And 
And right now, it's uh, especially sad because of all the turmoil that is happening in the Middle East, that many of the great world uh, heritage sites, like the Ziggurat of Ur, is, is slowly being destroyed and trampled over by um, terrorists and militants. Well, then we get to the political decline of Sumer. So it rose very quickly and was very efficient with their irrigation system and their military. But we're going to get to a political decline. The Semitic peoples from northern Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia overshadow Sumer. Uh, for example, Sargon of Akkad, Akkad uh, destroyed the Sumerian city-states one by one, created an empire based in Akkad, Akkad, and the empire was unable to maintain chronic rebellions. So, uh, for example, if you think about the city-state model, it would be really good because you would have complete autonomy. Let's say you were the king of Sumer, for example, or the king of Uruk you would be able to pretty much decide what goes on in your city, how you do things. You'd be pretty set as a, a pretty nice life. But the problem is with the city-states is you're not really aligned. You're not politically motivated to help anybody else because it costs you resources and military to protect your neighbor. And so it's actually probably in your best interest to ignore if they fall to an enemy. But what ends up happening is Sargon of Akkad understands that if we just go around and destroy city-states one by one, eventually they won't be able to band together and help each other, and I'll be in charge, and he runs it from Akkad. Or Akkad. Uh, the empire is also unable to maintain chronic rebellions. People just pop up and say, we don't want to be ruled by you anymore, so uh, it slowly crumbles under uh, pressure from rebellions inside the uh, city-state. Hammurabi of Babylon is a uh, leader of Babylon, obviously, living from 1792 BCE to 1750 BCE. Now, his great contribution to world history is he improved taxation and uh, legalization. So uh, he created some of the world's first law systems and law code. He understood how to tax people in a way that was beneficial to the society and also provide goods and services for the people of that society so that they can feel safe and secure and well-maintained. Uh, he also used local governors to maintain control of city-states. He used a bureaucracy system. Now, a bureaucracy is when you appoint uh, people underneath you to be a representative in your place of your power. So Hammurabi would appoint some guy to go out and maintain control of the different city-states of Babylon, making sure that uh, the people paid their taxes, and if there was rebellions, he could get some information very quickly. So Hammurabi wasn't in charge uh, directly of all the city-states of Babylon, but he was able to kind of oversee them through the use of his bureaucracy. The Babylonian Empire is later destroyed by the Hittites from Anatolia around 1595 BCE. One of the lasting contributions that Hammurabi had was to the legal system with his Code of Hammurabi, it established high standards of behavior and stern punishment for violators. Let's say we're living back during the time of Sumer. And we are neighbors, you and I. And we are sitting in our fields and you are threshing your wheat with your, you know, sickle or whatever. And you're cutting down wheat and gathering it up. Well, as you're doing that, let's say my sheep wanders into your field and you kill my sheep by accident. Well, what should happen? Should I make you pay for the sheep? Should I kill your daughter? Should I beat you up and make you my slave for two years? There wasn't a very clear system or a consistent system of punishment for crimes. Another famous crime is murder. Uh, people obviously have, since the dawn of time, gotten mad at each other and killed one another over different issues. What should happen? If a man, say a nobleman, kills his slave, should the nobleman be put to death? That's one thing to think about. Or what if the slave kills his owner? Or what if a man and a man of similar class, of the same class, kill one another? What should happen to them? Well, the Code of Hammurabi actually placed very explicit punishments for violators, and it placed a high standard on protecting life as a whole. Now, it did this in terms of understanding social hierarchy, meaning that the people higher, such as the noble, the priest, got away with a lot more in our standards today than, say, someone who was a slave. In many instances of um, these types of codes, if a nobleman were to kill a slave, he would just have to pay the slave owner some money, the equivalent of the slave's 
a bounty or life. But if a slave was to kill a nobleman, he would be immediately put to death. But the key here is that uh, it laid out explicitly, so no one was without uh, understanding of what would happen to them if they were to break the law. In many cases in your life, you are very uh, well aware of what will happen to you if you were to do something, for example, at your home that your parents didn't like. You understand the punishment that you will receive for breaking those rules. If you stay out too late after your curfew, you might be grounded for X amount of time. If you really break the curfew and do something dumb, then obviously the punishment will be increased based on that um, transgression. And this comes from the Code of Hammurabi, the first guy to sit down and really uh, hash all these ideas out. His big idea is Lex Talonis, or the Law of Retaliation. The idea that uh, people should get some sort of equal compensation or just compensation for crimes committed against them. Now, uh, this isn't always completely equal in the way we would see it today, but at least within their society, they would have understood it as at least an attempt at equality from from those examples I talked about in the past where, uh, for example, if a slave killed an owner or an owner killed a slave, social status and punishment were very heavily intertwined, even uh, up until uh, very recently in our modern day and the history we're going to study near the end of our course. Later Mesopotamian empires, there's a weakening of central rule, an invitation to foreign invaders. As the bureaucracy breaks down and central rule and strong leadership doesn't arise more and more like Hammurabi, basically the bureaucrats of those city-states decide to do kind of whatever they want, and by ignoring a lot of the rules or not having a very strong system to protect the people of the city-states, invitation from foreign invaders kind of uh, fragments the city-states of Mesopotamia, and the Assyrians are also um, a new force on the scene using new iron weaponry. Now, iron is very heavy, strong metal. If you think about it up until this point, people were finding metal around. They were heating it up, hammering it together. And iron is a very good uh, metal because you can heat it up. It can be formed. It can be shaped. It can be made very sharp. It can be made into swords, axes, whatever you need to t attack people, uh, hurt people. And if for example, you were fighting against a group of people and you were an Assyrian that's an iron tool, but they had, say, wood sticks, I think you're going to win. Your iron sword is going to beat their wooden sticks. Beginning uh, 1300 BCE, by the 8th to 7th centuries BCE, control of Mesopotamia, Syria, and Palestine and most of Egypt is done by the Assyrians because of this use of new iron weaponry. This is the, one of the first big examples we're going to look at of using modern or newest technology to defeat your enemies. If you don't have the tools, even if you have a very strong army, but you don't have the tools to utilize that technology, you are going to have lots of problems in fighting them because they are going to uh, run right over you with their stronger technology. Iron doesn't break as much as, say, wood, especially after, you know, however many people you need to hit or kill or stab or whatever. Uh... Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, he rules from 605 to 562 BCE, takes advantage of internal descent to create the Chaldean or Chaldean New Babylonian Empire. It's a famous, luxurious capital. It is known for its um, hanging gardens. It's known for its uh, libraries. It's known for its culture, as we, that high culture we talked about. And it was known as a, a, a culture that really focused on lavishness and luxury, uh, something that had yet to be seen up until that point. Here in the Mesopotamian empires, 1800 to 600 BCE, you can see the Assyrian in green, the Hammurabi's empire, which is in red, and the Hittite empire in purple, and you can see what was conquered uh, by the Hittites, that grayish striped line. Next we have technological development in Mesopotamia. Uh, they developed bronze, which is copper melted together with tin around 4000 BCE, it has military and agricultural applications. Bronze, obviously, a uh, very strong type of metal, once uh, kind of an alloy, which is mixed together. And it's great because in the military, you can build uh, bronze spears, tips, you can build swords, you can build uh, shields, you can build all the things that you need for a military. And there's agricultural applications. You can build uh, plows to plow your fields, you can build uh, wheels and connecting parts to all your tools that you're using in the field and uh, 
they get iron around 1000 BCE. It's cheaper than bronze because uh, copper and tin must be harvested from the earth separately and then uh, made into an alloy by melting them together and mixing them. But iron, on the other hand, is found in its raw form and then just kind of deep, uh, which is purified through heat, and then you're able to make swords of that. They also are able to develop wheels and boats around 3500 BCE. Shipbuilding, it increases their trade networks. If you think about it, if you're living in, um, I'll go back here, this area, there's a very large uh, system of rivers. And there's also a couple of very large uh, seas that we would see, the Aegean Sea, Mediterranean, the Red Sea, the Persian Gulf, the Caspian, and the Black Sea. You can travel by boat through all those areas and get large distances with very little manpower, with very little animal power, just by using the winds, maybe even using the rowboats uh, or oars, you would be able to transport lots of goods across great distances with less fear of being robbed or attacked. Now, if you were to travel on roads and there were robbers, you didn't always have enough people to stop them, whereas on the ocean, you had to be competing against people who had boats as well, and many times it was safer to travel by sea in terms of um, traveling your goods because no one could really get to you versus if you were traveling on a road. All right, next we have the social classes. The ruling classes were based often on military prowess, uh, perceived as offspring of the gods. Many of the ruling classes during this time were uh, had some military lineage, military background to their family, which led them to be seen as very powerful. If your great-grandfather had killed a hundred men and led many men into battle, then obviously he was blessed by the gods, or maybe even one of the gods' children, and that is why he was able to be protected in battle, why he was able to kill many people, and that's why he should be in charge. Uh, they develop religious classes. Their role is intervention with gods to ensure good fortune for the community. Basically, the gods are far away, and we don't know what the gods want from us. Maybe they want us to kill cows. Maybe they want us to offer them wheat. Maybe they want us to do, I don't know, crazy other things. What we need to do is find some group of people who will tell us what the gods want, and then we'll do those things and help them to make the gods happy, and then the gods will make us happy by giving us good harvest, many sons through childbearing maybe they will give us rain when we need rain maybe they'll make sure that the rivers are going well maybe when we die they take us to the right place in the afterlife so it's not like a sad thing well if you are worried about all those things you're going to create a religious class who are going to say yes we know what you need to do to make the gods happy the religious classes also had considerable land holding they had a lot of land because they could make the argument, look, the, the gods want cows to be sacrificed, so we need a cow for every family in our community, so we're going to have lots of land for these cows to graze on, and once we slaughter the cows and, and make a burnt offering to God or the gods, then the meat left over, we can have a big feast, and the gods will be happy because we offered the blood and the sacrifice of the animal to the gods, and now that the gods are happy, we can eat it, and that is all a part of the role of the religious classes. There were also free commoners. Uh, these are just common people, normal people, worker people. Uh, there were peasant cultivators. These are people whose job was just to go around and farm. They really didn't uh, make any money. They probably didn't do very much trade. What they probably did was uh, grow food just to survive, and then any extra they might have taken to market or maybe pay their taxes with. There were some urban professionals as a part of the free commoner system. These urban professionals would have been uh, very basic forms of some of the things I talked about before, like doctors. Now, they wouldn't have been doctors with doctor's offices like we talked about, but they maybe had some special skills like surgery. There would have been barbers. There would have been uh, dentists, which would actually overlap in a lot of areas with barbers. They would have had uh, some lawyers for when bad things were happening and you needed someone to protect you in a court system. They would have probably had tax collectors, but they had some urban people who lived in cities whose jobs were just to do certain tasks for the community. And then finally, we have slaves. These are prisoners of the war. If we were to go to war with the neighboring city-state or country, we would take their men or young men as prisoners, and then they would work for us in our fields. They also had convicted criminals, so if you stole a bunch of sheep from somebody or you did something really bad, then obviously you're going to be a slave that might have been your punishment, and debtors. This has always confounded me throughout history, is that many times debtors, people who owed money, became slaves. Now, if you were uh, somebody who was owed money, let's say I, I owed you 
uh, 10 years worth of wages. Let, think about whatever job you want in the future, take the amount of money they make, and multiply it by 10. Now, if I owed you that much money, obviously I need to find a way to pay it back. Now, if I had a job that was able to pay you back, then I probably would. But if I didn't have a job that was able to pay you back and you had lent me all that money, you could take me to court, you could sue me, and then you could get the court to basically say that I'm your slave and to work off my debt. And many times it was more than what the debt was worth. So if it's the 10 years that I owed you in terms of money, I might have to work and pay back my debt by working for you for 15 years or 20 years. Uh, the slaves, though, are very valuable to this early system uh, of um, society because basically once, as long as you take care of your slaves by feeding them and clothing them and housing them, you get free labor. You don't have to pay them, and they work as hard as you basically want them to. So it works out pretty well. It won't eventually, but for right now it's a very good system. The society of this time was patriarchal. Patriarchal is uh, male-centered or male-focused. It shows men as landowners, and it has a relationship to status. If you have lots of land, then obviously you are very important. If you don't have lots of land, you are not very important. The more land and the more uh, heads of cattle, for example, or the more acreage of wheat or rice or whatever, you were a very influential person within the community. Uh, patriarchy is translated as the rule of the father or the father of the house is in charge. Uh, they had the right to sell their wives or their children. If, for example, a um, guy comes home one day and he's just not really feeling like his wife is living up to what he wants her to be, he could go to his neighbor and sell his wife off, and he had complete right to do that in this society. If he felt, if the father of the house felt that he had too many children, or especially if he had too many daughters, he might uh, sell off some of his children to the government or to the temple or to wherever, and he had the right to do that because uh, under the patriarchal system, uh, children and wives, especially women, were seen as property of their male uh, either fathers or husbands or uh, brothers, depending on the situation. Uh, there was a double standard of sexual morality. If you were caught for adultery within the society, uh, you were drowned for adultery. So they would take you to a river and just dunk you in the river until you drowned, or maybe tie weights around you and throw you in the river, and you just drown there. Uh, yet, at the same time, there was relaxed sexual mores for men. Men were seen as uh, able to go around and pretty much sleep with whoever they wanted and it wasn't really looked down upon it was seen as something as uh, valuable and in no way does that uh, idea carry around to this day now does it yet some possibilities of social mobility for women there was some uh, parts of society where women were able to get their own way and in a lot of ways be influential they were court advisors uh they were temple priestesses and economic uh, activity the court advisor part is interesting because they were able to help with um, giving decisions and helping the laws function and they gave a lot of wisdom the temple priestesses is interesting as well because under the temple priestess system you have a lot of power if you are a temple priestess you are communing with the gods you are talking to the far beyond the thing that we can't see and the thing we can't understand and try and keep happy but you have the power to tell me what to do to make the gods happy and that power uh holds a lot of sway for a lot of women during this time they also are an economic activity they're doing trading buying uh small scales of that uh there's also the introduction of the veil at least uh 1500 bce so if you think about it the veil uh, that women would wear, say, like, if you've ever been to a funeral, you might have seen women wearing a black veil or a see-through, almost, like, curtain over their face. Uh, they were seen in many societies from different angles. For some societies, it's seen as protecting women from the gaze of men, like the look of men, and them staring at them all the time. But in, in many societies, in many cultures, the veil is seen as hiding women. It's designed to kind of get them out of the way and not make them a distraction and put them in the background and marginalize them. And that's kind of what happens through this patriarchal society. Next, we have the development of writing. The Sumerians experiment with pictographs, basically drawing pictures that kind of represent things. But if I drew a picture of a bird, 
and I drew a picture of me right next to the bird, you might not really understand what I'm trying to communicate. You might think bird and Toyama or teacher or man or did he eat the bird? Did he throw the bird? Did he catch the bird? Did he, you know what I'm saying? The pictographs don't really, aren't very clear. Around 2900 BCE, Sumerians create a writing system. Uh, it's very, very basic. You can see it on the right-hand side. It's a series of lines, triangles, points. Uh, it's known as cuneiform or wedge-shaped writing. Uh, it's, it's got some pluses and minuses, especially for an early writing system. It's amazing that they were able to find a uniform system of symbols. If you've ever played around with like a secret decoder ring, or you've played around with maybe some certain symbols like in a book you found on the internet or something and maybe you wrote secret messages like a spy when you were a kid to your neighbor or to your brother or sister or to your friends that's basically what cuneiform was it it was only really understood within the society and like most alphabets even today letters have certain sounds and this was revolutionary because for the first time in human history people were able to communicate uh, across time. If I were to live during that time, and I talked about all these amazing things, and maybe I made up all these stories, and maybe I was a poet or a writer or a singer or a playwright, but I had nothing to write it down or record it, well, then my message and my information is lost for all time. And no one will ever know what I said, what I thought, what I felt. But through cuneiform, the first time in human history we're able to record and write down people's ideas, their thoughts, their beliefs, everything about them and who they are, and record it for all time. And from there, we can look back at this stuff and we can understand what they were saying even back then. They had preservation of documents uh, on clay. Most of the time, the clay was used to record simple transactions, and it was really good because if you think about it, some of you guys want to own a business when you grow up. You need to have records. You sold this much stuff to this guy, he paid you this much for this product, yada, yada, yada. Many of this uh, early writing was a basic form of keeping tallies and marks on who owed what and what was supposed to happen and what were the laws and what were we supposed to do, yada, 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 right? Uh, it declines, the cuneiform declines around 400 BCE with the spread of the Greek alphabet system. Uh, the If you've ever seen, like, sororities or fraternities those are greek letters the alpha the omega the epsilon the delta the pi the phi the rho like all those letters that you've heard about in terms of sororities and fraternities that's the greek alphabet system and it has a very simple form it's very clear if you look at the tablet on the right and here i'll even give us a better picture if you look at the letters on the right it's even with a very clear uh, clean copy it's really hard to really distinguish where one letter begins and one letter ends and what like the connections are to the letters you don't know how many words are in this you don't even know how many letters or symbols are supposed to make however many sounds whereas in the greek system think about like a word like dog d-o-g it's very clear where they begin where they end it's very clear what the sounds are supposed to be and you can always play around with those uh forms but dog will never make a different sound because it's next to another word for example dog and then cat is never going to be or anything other than that because it's very clear which letters go where whereas uh, with the cuneiform not super clear or great now there's some uses for writing obviously like i talked about trade economics uh, just keeping track of i sold 100 grain pounds of rice to this guy and he paid me a hundred whatever money we're using for this example dollars right it's also good for astronomy if you are out in the woods say even today and you're camping and you look up at the sky you're gonna see lots of stars well it's really cool to be able to write down okay when i stood in this spot on the 10th day of the year the star was right above this thing whereas 20 days later it was a little to the left or a little to the right and it helps to understand the way the planets are moving stars are moving and eventually the planets are moving and this is some of the first uh kind of attempts at uh, astronomy it's also good for mathematics uh if any of you have ever tried to do math in your head and have failed miserably that is because you need to write things down obviously and being able to see the symbols use the symbols to manipulate and uh figure out 
how much you need of something or how much uh, something is, you need to try and use symbols to represent those ideas. So two cats is the number two, and like three dogs is the number three, right? Uh, it had agricultural application, specifically the calculation of time. If you remember back to our first chapter, there were hunter-gatherer society. You didn't really need to know when anything was. It wasn't that important. Uh, you followed the deer around, and sometimes it got cold, and sometimes it was hot. And you just didn't really care that much. And maybe the stars moved and stuff, and it was cool. But if you are a, a society that relies very heavily on flooding of rivers, on uh, growing seasons, on knowing when to plant something and when to harvest something, you're going to need to have a very accurate calculation of time. And the uh, societies that we've been studying right now uh, were the first to give us the 12-month year and the 24-hour day and the 60-minute hour. Now, they were able to do this by figuring out how the sun moves, how long it takes to go from point A to point B. Uh, they figured out how the stars kind of go in the same pattern every 365 plus or minus days a year. And they were able to get it really, really close to what we would understand to our modern uh, system of time and uh, the calendar. Next, we have Mesopotamian literature. We have the Epic of Gilgamesh. It's compiled after 2000 BCE. It's a heroic saga. Now, a saga is a very cool story about a guy. And the, guy's main, the main guy's name is Gilgamesh. And Gilgamesh's big thing is he doesn't want to die. And so Gilgamesh starts to search uh, for meaning, especially in the afterlife. He doesn't understand why people die. He's like, it's pretty cool here on Earth. And, and Gilgamesh is well-to-do. He doesn't really uh, have need for a lot of things. Gilgamesh's story is really most famous for a couple things. Number one, it's famous because it's some of the earliest form of storytelling. It's one of the world's first like stories that people told each other, and it was translated or at least uh, transcribed from oral storytelling. People would sit around fires at night or maybe in halls and tell one another this story, and, and it was just carried on through tradition of handing it down from one teller to the next. But the problem if you've ever played telephone is that it can kind of get corrupted. But if you have literature, which relies on an alphabet and cuneiform, well, then you're going to be able to record it very clearly what actually happened. Now, Gilgamesh is also important for another reason. Gilgamesh, at one point in the story, uh, goes to look for the gods to try and get them to answer his questions. And one of the gods tells him that there is going to be a great rain, and the great rain is going to flood all the earth. And so what Gilgamesh needs to do is build a giant boat, and he needs to build a giant square boat, and he needs to build it so many cubits high and so many cubits deep and so many cubits long, and that will protect him and his peeps from uh, the world being destroyed. And so Gilgamesh builds this giant boat, or an ark, and he puts uh, himself and his partner in Kaidu, which is the dude that looks kind of like a goat, which was kind of like half, I think it was half bull during this story, and uh, they're saved, and when it starts to kind of stop raining, after about 40 days, plus or minus, uh, Gilgamesh sends out a bird, the bird comes back one time with nothing, the bird goes out again, it comes back again. And if you're getting kind of where I'm going with this, this sounds a lot like the biblical story of Noah's Ark. The biblical story of Noah's Ark is not unique to just Noah, it was actually uh, even older from the Epic of Gilgamesh. So take with that, or do with that, that what you will, but it is a uh, very important piece of comparative literature to, to look at. And then finally, Gilgamesh is very famous for his takeaway point, or his moral of his story, which is once he finally realizes that he's going to die and that uh, he can't avoid death, he kind of derives the meaning that life is only as good as what you do with it, and that the way to live on forever is in what you build. And so he looks at the ziggurats, he looks at the uh, society around him, and realizes that he and his society will be remembered forever for their great creation and their great uh, way of making the world, and that is the way you live forever. Some people would take that and say, of course, you know, we, we only get one shot at this life, so we better do the best we can with it and maybe make the world a better place before we leave. And some people, you know, will say that, no, you know, this life doesn't matter as much. But wherever you stand on this, it, it has, especially in the Epic of Gilgamesh, a this world emphasis, that this world is what matters. The afterlife is just kind of a place of 
crap and sap and sadness and nothing really great happens there but in this world you can you can live it up you can eat you can drink you can party you can build amazing things art architecture literature all these sort of super cool things and you get to do that now so make hay while the day is young and now we're going to transition a little bit to the early Hebrews, another group of people that was uh, around this time in Mesopotamia. According to Hebrew scripture, uh, there was a man named Abram uh, who travels uh, to northern Mesopotamia around 1850 BCE from Ur of the Chaldeans. So he basically is moving from that city I pointed out a little bit ago, and he's moving west which would be today around modern Palestine. And while he's wandering around there, he is given a sign by God or a symbol by God and a message uh, that there is going to be an offspring or a, a society that comes from Abram and they are going to number more than the stars. And the God of Abram promises him that that his gener his family will live on forever. And Abram will eventually change his name to Abraham. And he's going to uh, kind of look at the world in a way that kind of is very radical and different from people up until this point. He's going to start to believe in one God, that there's no other God except for uh, what he calls Yahweh. And Yahweh is the God of the universe, the God of everything, the God of the trees, the water, the earth, the sky, the moon, the stars, everything you see and everything you can't see, uh, Yahweh is in charge of. And not only is Yahweh in charge of everything, all the other gods that all the other societies and all the other people say are gods are not gods. They are made up. They are fake. So Abraham is going to have that uh, early belief. And uh this parallels early biblical texts in the Code of Hammurabi, especially under a man named uh, Moses, as represented by Charlton Heston in the famous Ten Commandments movie here in this picture. The scriptures state uh, Hebrews under Moses are going to Palestine around 1300 BCE after being uh, held as slaves in Egypt. Uh, there is a point of contention here because many sources of history don't actually point to the Hebrews ever being enslaved in uh, Egypt, but historians were willing to at least accept that the Bible has some sort of cultural uh, significance and historicity because of its uh, age and tradition itself. Uh, as the Hebrews under Moses go into the country of Palestine, there are people living there already in city-states, and under Moses's follower Joshua, they begin to clear out a section of what is now known as Palestine for uh, people to live in. And that's where they will eventually set up the kingdom of Israel. And under the kingdom of Israel, uh, the Jews will eventually uh, elect a king or have a king named David. And he will rule from 1,000 to 970 BC, and then his son Solomon, who was known as Solomon the Wise, uh, would rule from 970 to 930 BCE. And this is a very just quick snapshot of some of the history of the early Hebrews. If you would like more information, obviously the Old Testament of Hebrew scripture, or the, the Bible, or what we would call the Torah, uh, for a lot of that. Here's a picture of David, the very famous picture of King David. Nice uh, little square for us to shield our eyes. And yeah, Moses and monotheism. The Hebrews originally shared polytheistic beliefs of other Mesopotamian civilization. The Hebrews were not special originally because they did believe in many gods, and those many gods uh, especially were uh, like the moon gods and the sun god and and the stars and the rocks everybody everybody's a god right in those like systems and the hebrews were believing that yes there are many gods and they are in charge of different things and we have to worship all of them well then moses shows up and says no there's no god but yahweh and we are to worship yahweh and only pray to yahweh and sacrifice only to yahweh because yahweh's the only real god and not only is he the only god he's in charge of all the other gods and the other gods aren't really real, so it doesn't matter about all those other gods, so we're just going to believe in Yahweh. And they denied the existence of competing parallel deities. He was a personal god. Uh, 
they believe that he cared about what you did. Not only about what you did on a daily basis, but he believed that you could do actions that transgress not just against God, but transgress against your neighbor. There was a reward and punishment for conformity with the revealed law. Uh, if you've ever met somebody who's Jewish, they believe, for example, if they're, if they're a practicing Jew, that um, eating certain things like certain animals is what we would call not kosher or uh, pure, and so you shouldn't eat them. And if you eat them, you have offended God. Same thing with um, certain festivals, certain rituals, certain actions. Uh, they believe that God, and still to this day, many Jews believe that God cares deeply about what you do in your daily life, and the way to honor God and to make God happy is to follow all the rules. In uh, the Old Testament, there is about 613 uh, biblical laws that highlight what you are to do and what you are supposed to not do, and um, that is pretty much a Jewish person's life who practices. They believe that, for example, you should cover your head if you're male. You should have, you should not cut the sideburns off the side of your head, so they have curls many times, Orthodox Jews do. They believe that you should um, not round the corners of your garments, so you have very specific, um, like these shawls that the uh, Orthodox Jews wear. And there are many other uh, traditions and uh, practices that they follow to honor God. Uh, their ultimate uh, belief in their scriptures or their sacred text would be known as the Torah, which is the doctrine or teaching. Um, this is kind of what we would call the Old Testament if you're a Christian, if you are um, somebody who is coming from the, from the outside. If you were to pick up a Bible, it's the first half of the Bible uh, before all the Jesus stuff. So that's kind of where the Jews are coming from. There are foreign conquests of Israel. The Assyrian conquest in 722 BCE, it conquered the northern kingdom. By this point, Israel has been split into two kingdoms. There's Israel and Judah, and Israel in the north, and the ten original tribes, which come from the tribes of Joseph. It is a very uh, long story, which we don't have time to get into. But the northern kingdom is conquered, which leaves just Judah in the south. Uh, they deported, the Assyrians deported many inhabitants to other regions. So originally the Assyrians had this brilliant idea. They, uh, rather than conquering an area and leaving the people to get really mad and really pissed off and maybe organize people, they would take a lot of their intellectuals, a lot of the people who were with military prowess, and they would bring them back to their homeland and keep them far away from their people so that the people who were left behind were unable to really incite rebellion because they didn't have military leaders or they didn't have people who could get really organized. They didn't have influential people who could like read, for example, and send uh, transcripts like scribes. And many exiles assimilated and lost their identity. If you were to send away from Israel to Assyria, you would probably start to buy into the culture in many ways. Uh, this is, for those of you familiar, is where the book of Daniel is kind of taking place around this time, especially under the Babylonian conquest uh, in 586 BCE. Then they destroy Jerusalem. They force many into exile. This is where the biblical story of, da of Daniel picks up. Uh, he is forced away into exile because he is a learned person. Uh, the Israelites maintain their religious identity, and many return to Judea. Uh, there, that's pretty much the whole latter half of the Old Testament or the Jewish Bible where people are returning, they're rebuilding, they're setting up Jerusalem and Judea all over again to try and make it a place where people can live, especially their people. Here's Israel and Phoenicia. Israel is in the bottom right where it says Palestine, and there's that little thing that says Jerusalem. There's Syria, Egypt. Uh, yeah. And then there's a little kind of inset, which is near the top. You can see the zoomed-in part. There's Palestine, and Jerusalem is the little tiny dot that's right there. Now, the Phoenicians are city-states along the Mediterranean coast after 3000 BC. They're really important because of their extensive maritime trade. They're some of the first people to really get really good at trading along the Mediterranean. If you can trade, you have a lot of power because you have a lot of uh, money, you have a lot of resources, you're getting a lot of influence because people want your stuff. And if you're able to take very far away things and bring it to them, like food or like exotic, I don't know, pottery or jewelry, then people are willing to pay for that because it's from far away and you're going to make a killing. Uh, they dominated the Mediterranean trade from 1200 to 800 BCE. Uh, they developed alphabet symbols. 
a simpler alternative to cuneiform and this spread of literacy. If you're wandering around and you're trading and you develop a system of alphabet symbols that is simpler than cuneiform and you teach it to people as you go along and trade, this is going to make trade easier, more efficient, and you're going to make more money. So a lot of people pick it up just because they're really, really interested in making money. Then we have Indo-European migrations, common roots of many languages of Europe, Southeast Asian, India. So when you think about Europe, Southeast Asian, Indian languages, uh, this comes from Indo-European migrations, implies the influence of a single Indo-European people. There was originally one group of people, and we all kind of spread out from there in terms of Europe, Southeast Asia, and India. Their probable original homeland would be known as modern-day Ukraine slash Russia, 4500 to 2500 BCE. Uh, they were able to domesticate horses. When you think about it, horses were kind of just wild animals, just like wolves eventually become dogs. The wild horse eventually is domesticated to be used as a farm animal or an animal of war, basically an animal of transport. They also use uh, Sumerian weaponry, allowed them to spread quickly and widely. Uh, if you have really good weapons, again, people aren't going to really be able to stop you if you have better weapons than they do. As you can see from the very center of this picture, the Indo-European homeland, they spread all over. They go as far as Spain, they go all the way out to India, they get almost to China, and they get all the way south to like the... Middle East, what we would call today, they go to Anatolia, which is Turkey. They move up north to like the Nordic nations. They spread around everywhere. The implications of Indo-European migration uh, is basically the Hittites migrate to central Anatolia, again, Turkey, uh, 1900 BCE, later dominate Babylonia, and they have an influence on trade. Horses and chariots that spoke to wheels. If you have uh, never seen a horse and then you get to see horses and they're domesticated and they're able to pull plows and move carts and let you ride on them and move you very quickly from town to town or from place to place and then you also have chariots which have spoked wheels which means they're able to turn very freely you can replace the wheels and you attach them to these horses and you can ride uh, behind the horses and they'll move you very quickly without like worrying about the horse like tossing you off uh, that's amazing they also bring in iron, again, for weapons, for trade, for farming. And then they have migrations to Western China, Greece, Italy are also significant. We'll get to that a little later. And we're there. We're at the end. When you finish studying this chapter, you should be able to do the following. Discuss the early development of Sumer. Why is Sumer important and what happened in the early days? Next, compare and contrast the Mesopotamian empires. There were many empires we were talking about through this lecture. Kind of break them down. I'd make a chart with little columns, figure out who did what, what one was better at what, yada, yada, yada. Then describe the significant developments of specialization and trade in the Mesopotamian economy. Why is specialization so revolutionary to this time? And how is trade, especially in the Mesopotamian economy, uh, influencing the rest of the world. Next, explain the emergence of a stratified patriarchal society. Uh, how and why did the patriarchal society spring up during this time? How is it like structured? How does it look? Who's at the top? Who's at the bottom? What do they do at the top and what do they do at the bottom? Next, outline the causes and effects of a written cultural tradition in Mesopotamia. What caused uh, writing to show up there was a very specific reason and then what were some of the effects of having all this awesome new technology which is writing next discuss the influence of Mesopotamian civilization on other regional societies how did with uh, Mesopotamia spreading out affect the rest of the world especially around it and finally identify the key aspects and effects of the Indo-European migrations uh, how did uh, the Indo-Europeans spread out. Where did they go? Why did they go there? And what were some of the awesome things they brought along with them when they arrived? Here's your writing assignment. Write a four, short response, five-day sentences to the following questions using specific examples from the textbook and be prepared to discuss them in the class. Some historians refer to Mesopotamia as the cradle of civilization. Why is this? Do you agree that civilization originated here? Why or why not? Next, number two. Compare and contrast the lasting contributions of the Sumerians, Jews, Phoenicians, and Indo-Europeans. I see a four-column chart right there. Which culture do you believe made the most significant contributions and why? And finally, number three, 
Warfare was a significant factor in the development of all the cultures discussed in this chapter. Analyze how political institutions, economic factors, social factors, and technology interplayed to create conflict and war throughout this region. This is a war, war, war chapter. So make sure you're able to uh, look at it from all different sides, and we'll break that down when I see you next time. As always, it's time to reread. I am very thankful that you are uh, were able to join me for this lecture. Uh, go ahead and bust out those books. Finish your writing assignment. I will see you very soon. Bye. What we do here is go back, 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 back.